Hi, I'm uh, Professor Leanne Woodward from the School of Health Sciences and I'm delighted to be here to help compare the evening and to welcome you all to the University of Canterbury to an, uh, a group of speakers who are going to address the issue of quake kids and how after 10,000 earthquakes how do we help our tamariki? And I'm sure this is an issue very dear to all of our hearts, seeing how many of you have come out on this beautiful evening. Uh, in the modern world, disasters are going to be an increasing part of our lives with climate change and global warming. And um, certainly New Zealand has had their fair share of it over the last decade. We've had, obviously, the Canterbury earthquakes, we've had the Kaikoura earthquake, and uh, flooding episodes, as well as more recently the fires in the Nelson area. And I understand, you know, there's people here both in the audience and on Facebook from, from across the country. And so that's very exciting to have you here at the University of Canterbury joining us. I'm delighted to introduce this. We have four panelists and how it will work is that each of the panelists will speak and uh, then there'll be an opportunity to, for discussion and questions at the end. Uh, they will essentially, uh, I'll introduce them actually now, but then I'll talk a little bit about how it will be sh shaped and the focus for the talks. Uh, the first person I'd love to introduce really is probably the architect of all of this work is Kathleen, Associate Professor Kathleen Liberty in the School of Health Sciences. I've had a long-standing relationship with Kathleen because she helped mentor me as a junior academic when I was beginning my teaching career quite a few years ago. And I'm really excited to see this work. I think it really is the culmination of a career's worth of passion and focus on children's learning, but very much from a holistic well-being perspective. Kathleen is joined by three other people, and I think this really reflects sort of part of why I think the work is so good, is that it's not just being an ivory tower academic who's sitting in her office thinking about these ideas, but it's been very much a, a collaboration with, the, with people in the community. And three important people in this have been Maureen Allen uh, in the white, uh, who was the cluster manager Tipara, resource teacher of learning and behaviour. Also, we have John Bangma, who's principal of Maraha Primary School uh, and also a former president of the Canterbury Primary Principals Association. And a further role is Britta Liberty, a school teacher and parent. So, the focus of this talk today, and often in a, in a disaster, many people run away and these are four people that definitely leaned in in a time when children were in crisis in our schools and we were struggling in Canterbury to know how to really navigate this very new territory. What Kathleen and her colleagues have done is initially they've done a series of studies first to sort of understand the impacts of the earthquakes were having on children's learning and behaviour. But then importantly, thinking about what, we were, what they were seeing in children from a psychobiological model, and that's really, you know, to bring that down to sort of lay speak, is how does stress get under the skin and why do we see these, these difficulties with learning? And I know that Kathleen will speak to that a little. But then based on what they learnt from this de early descriptive work, what they have done is develop a very novel and innovative and importantly evidence-based intervention that uh, w they then trialled in schools and has had some very positive benefits for children. And so she's going to be sharing some of their insights from their research and how we can help children in this um, new world that we live. So, thank you. I'd like to hand over first to Maureen Allen. I think Maureen will speak, and then John, Britta, and then Kathleen, and I will field questions at the end. And if you're on Facebook, you can send your uh, questions via Facebook, 
and they will be compiled and we'll answer them as part of the question and answer session. Thank you and welcome. Tina Koto Katoa, Ko Moring Tuku Inga, Noa, Ko Moring Tuku Inga, Tua Tumawaki, O Te Kura Waitaha Aho. My name is Maureen Allen. I'm a wife, mother of two, and have just begun as principal of Waitaha School. Until last month, I was cluster manager of uh, the Resource Teachers of Learning and Behaviour in the south and east of Christchurch, <coughs> Te Pairoa Cluster, a position I began in 2012. During the first year I was cluster manager, in 2012, I was contacted by many principals, senior leaders and teachers, expressing concerns regarding the five-year-old children in their schools. The recurring theme of the conversations was that this group of children were different to the five-year-olds they were used to. They outlined communication concerns that the they outlined communication concerns that the language skills of the 2012 five-year-olds was very immature and both receptive, what they understood, and expressive communication, how they communicated to each other <coughs> and others. These children were clingy, often seeking adult reassurance. There were extreme emotional highs and lows, for example, crying over small issues to very elevated and agitated behaviours. The children struggled to follow instructions and would require one-to-one -one assistance to begin tasks. Teacher all, teachers also reported concerns regarding toileting. Self-management, communication and dysregulation were commonly used descriptors of the children in cluster schools in this early post-earthquake period. These behaviours were extreme and prevalent within the whole year one cohort across south, the south and east of Christchurch. Interventions used prior to the earthquakes were not effective. These interventions relied on language, processing and communication skills. The RTLB were familiar with interventions focusing on social skills programs, um, which promoted the development of relationships, emotions and feelings, and following inclusive best practice, the RTLB also set up strategies such as cooperative learning and peer tutoring, both of which require a higher level of expressive skills and the skills of group work engagement. RTLB would also look towards incentive strategies such as contingency reward charts. However, these children were so heightened <clears throat> that the typical reward charts and consequences were not effective. I'll share with you a case uh, um, example from this time. This example is reflected of, reflective of many requests for support which came through the cluster following the earthquakes. Two five-year-old boys in the same class were presenting with very reactive, volatile behaviour. These boys would throw furniture and react violently to changes in the environment or the timetable. Both had difficulty with literacy. Reading, they were unable to retain information. Writing, they had immature fine motor skills and couldn't retain their writing ideas. They struggled to follow a series of instructions. They would overreact if another child or adult came into their personal space. They were unable to read facial expressions of adults and peers. The expectations of early literacy were not met. For example, these children didn't know their nursery rhymes and struggled with early literacy concepts. The RTLB observed within the classroom environment undertook a series of um, oral language assessments and these boys presented with oral language skills of uh, two-year-olds. Subsequent assessments showed significant weaknesses in working memory and a difficulty to chain events. The RTLB began to use interventions which would focus on calm down spaces and teaching the child to breathe and identify how they were feeling. These interactions focused on the child and assumed a level of emotional cognition that these children do not actually have. At this time we were trying to modify behaviour using the behaviour management principles which we'd been trained to, to identify and apply. Everyone wanted to help these children but the strategies we were using were not working. Mid-2012, I met Dr Kathleen Liberty whilst establishing a connection with our cluster to, um, uh, along with her university students. 
I shared with Kathleen my concerns and frustrations. Later that day, Kathleen came back to me with the most exciting news, which held two parts. There was opportunity to explore the post-earthquake concerns I had raised, and Kathleen had pre-earthquake data from, for the same age children within the same geographical area. This was the catalyst for a study which is the first of its kind, to gather some level of understanding what was, of what was happening for our young children using measures undertaken pre this natural disaster. I have been the luckiest educator in that we have used real life and current research to identify issues for our children, establishing strategies aimed at making a difference for children living in a disaster-struck community. For the RTLB and Te Pairoa cluster, the professional learning and ongoing application of this knowledge has been truly amazing and also very rare. Te Pairoa RTLB work in a challenging area of Christchurch, but have been blessed with the richest and most appropriate professional knowledge as a result of the study. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko John Bangler, taku ingoa, ko tumuaki o te kura marihau. Uh, I am John Bangler. I am um, the very privileged and pleasure of being the principal of Marihau Primary School. Um, I was past president of the Canterbury Primary Principals Association and now treasurer. I'm also uh, on the executive of the New Zealand Principals Federation, but I also have a life outside of school sometimes. I'm a husband of uh, 40 years. Um, I'm the father of four amazing kids, father-in-law of four amazing in-laws, and Parker, or granddad, to 11 awesome grandchildren. Yeah, they treat you well. <laughs> These kids are different. There's something that's not right. Something isn't going right with these children. I had frustrated and stressed teachers Nothing worked anymore. Experienced teachers who said the strategies they had used in the past just made no difference. We struggled with working out whether this was a choice. Were these children choosing to be this way or was it a reaction? We also had parents who were stressed. They too had children maybe that were older that certain uh, parenting style worked, but these children were different. It worked for the older, but it wasn't working for the younger. We were really fortunate that at the right time, and because I've got over sensitive hearing, I heard a conversation happening about Kathleen's work, and so I was quick to put my oar in and ask if we could join this research, right place, right time. The research which we got and the information we got was shared with our staff, and it helped us to see that actually it wasn't the parents' fault, and it wasn't our staff's fault. So what can we do to help? The leadership team took on that lead. We needed to. And I'm very grateful that I have a staff that all were on board. We had to do things differently. That adage, if you keep doing what you always did, you know the one. It certainly needed to be done differently. So we adopted a number of strategies. The first strategy we adopted was play, eat, learn. Now we had a type 1 diabetic girl at school and we knew from her that when her blood sugars were checked, which had to be done regularly, even when she was writing in the classroom, her blood sugars went down. If that's the case for this little girl, why is it any different for the children in our class? Now, I taught in an era where, where the children were lethargic. You sent them for a run to energise them. Actually, what we should have done is fed them. Now, we have a different style. We play, then we eat, and then we learn. We learnt about healthy snacks. We learnt that wholemeal bread is our friend. And even though we got it in the neck from some parents who didn't like being advised on what would be a healthy snack for their child, we battled on. We changed our classroom environments. 
We needed to get rid of those long, and not just because I'm six foot three, but those things that straddle across the classroom with our artwork on it. Uh, apart from garroting me, I was delighted that we actually got rid of them. For children, all they saw was movement when they were trying to work. Every time you see anything on the news which is talking about earthquakes, what does it show you? The parapets falling. Even if they never witnessed it, it was their reality. We got rid of them. We cleared our windows. We recognised that windows are for letting light in, for seeing in and out of, and were not there to be filled up as display boards. We made the decision that our classrooms were no longer going to be art galleries, apart from reducing the stress on teachers of how many times you have to put that border just so. It actually made for a completely different environment. By making clear, calm and well-lit open classroom spaces, children were more ready and willing and able to learn. We took part in the sleep education. Some of our classes were looking at that and you'll hear a little bit more about that later on. But again, it made a difference for children because they started to understand their own sleep patterns and the part that they needed to take in that. Fish oil. I tried it, it's not my favourite. <laughs> we suggested to parents that this was something that actually had proven uh, records in terms of supporting children with post-traumatic stress disorder. We looked at a, a mantra of drink to think, think to drink. We encouraged our children to recognise that if you are dehydrated, you can't actually learn. So drink bottles were the norm, and that's okay. We preferred them to be clear because then you can actually see how much you've drunk. And with 31 degree days, as in today, that's what we need. We found out about reaching in, reaching out, a relationship building program, and it encouraged reflective practice, starting with yourself. First, we have to be right before we start to help the children. We trained as the leaders, and then we brought the experts in to train our staff. And it's been an ongoing focus within our teaching teams. We are very fortunate to be about to launch, we certainly hope, our building program. We're only a couple of years late. It's exciting to see that much of our school is going to be rebuilt. We had the, I've had the opportunity to visit a number of other schools that have already been built or rebuilt. And one school which I reflected on had a number of changing colour palettes featuring in each teaching space as I went through, red, orange, etc. And as I walked through, I walked into a blue palette and physically felt the difference. I will admit my scepticism dropped after that time. We've given the architect the research from Kathleen and we've given them the clear message that we expect that the information will be reflected in the environment in our rebuild. We know that three schools have already chosen to change their colour palette so that it's better to help the children. Pale blue, pale green, not red, not yellow, not lime. So to summarise, my suggestions are we need to stop the blame game. We need to rebuild the trust with parents, rebuild the trust in teachers, and rebuild within our communities. And the other thing is we need a willingness to change. We have to adapt because our children deserve it. Katangi te titi, katangi te kaka, katangi hoki a hau, tihei mauri ora. Hapai te a te aratika, pūmo a e te ranga te ratanga, mō ngā uri whakatipu. My name is Brie Liberty and I'm a wife, parent and a primary teacher. I am motivated to support our tamariki because they're my friends, my family, my community and my profession. The long-term effects of PTSD have taken a toll on parents, teachers and children alike. And as Maureen and John have said, 
What we thought used to be best practice techniques work, weren't working like they should. The first set of strategies implemented in schools was there to understand stress and to create a calm learning environment and also to improve our tamariki's health. The second set of strategies was designed to improve relationships and children's sleep. Finally, the last set of strategies has been designed to help children cope positively with stress and to learn empathy. We think that with the, these skills, are the skills that they will need to go through the less, rest of their lives, being able to tackle daily stresses. Using research-based self-determination learning theory and positive psychology, with my professional training and experience and enthusiasm, as a teacher, I designed and wrote programs to support the strategies. The programs were part of a series called Yes, I Can which was designed to empower Tamariki to make positive life changes that will improve their life today and into the future. The programs are Yes I Can Sleep, which is a sleep program to improve their sleep. Yes I Can Sparkle Under Pressure, which is a positive coping program from children from 9 to 12. And Yes I Can Be Kind, which is a kindness program aimed at the junior school. First thing I did was I adapted a research-based approaches to pathways goal setting, and that's specifically designed for our Tamariki in Christchurch. All three programs are underpinned by this goal setting method, and it aims to develop hope and motivation. The way that it works is you have your goal, and the Tamariki choose that goal themselves, and it's based on their own personal voice. And then what they do is they develop multiple pathways to achieve their goal. They come up with things that might go wrong in achieving that goal. And they come up with solutions for them. And they do all of those things before they've even tried to act their goal out. And that means that our tamariki have got their goal that they've written themselves. They've thought of things that could go wrong and they've already experienced success in tackling them. And that means when they're ready to go for their goal, they have multiple things that they can try, and that's why it's really effective. The main point of the goal setting was to get everyone to realise it's so important for Tamariki to use their personal voice to write their goal. We had one girl who was completely disconnected for most of the sleep inquiry until she realised that she could choose her own goal and she could choose what changes she was going to make in her life. And a quote that was recorded really got to me. And she said that she was sick of goals being done to her. And I think that that's really important for our tamariki. And that's what drives motivation. Yes, I Can Sleep was the first program. And we trialled it in 2017. Sleep was important to address first because sleep improves children's memory and it also improves their ability to learn new skills. So we thought before we learn them how to deal with stress and how to cope with it, what we needed to do is we needed to give them the tools that they would need to be able to learn the new information. Research has shown that as little as 10 minutes of consistently lost sleep a night can result in the same symptoms as ADHD. And seven minutes of, sleep, of more sleep a night can really improve children's ability to cope. This research is specifically important for our tamariki in Christchurch because the study showed that 70% of parents reported their children were having sleep issues. Some of the problems our tamariki had included taking hours to fall asleep, not being able to sleep alone in their bed, waking up too often, or not being, not being able to go back to sleep when they woke up. They were having nightmares or tantrums at bedtime. Yes, I Can Sleep is a two-part inquiry. The inquiry aims to teach Tamariki about the importance of sleep. It builds an understanding that sleep impacts all aspects of their life, from health to friendships, from learning to well-being, from physical fitness to mood. It also introduces Tamariki to key topics like sleep spaces, sleep hygiene, and sleep cycles. 
The inquiry is child-led because sleep is a really broad topic and I needed to give them as, we needed to give them as much information as we could so that they could find the thing that's really important to them and research further into it. They needed to use the inquiry so that in the action phase they could make connections with their own body and well-being. The second part of the sleep, the sleep program is becoming a sleep scientist where they gather data and they collect information about how they sleep and they track their sleep using sleep slips. This means that they can take the learning they got from the inquiry stage, evidence from their sleep, and they can create really effective goals that will be useful for them. The goals we had varied greatly. We had children that learnt to fall asleep within minutes rather than hours. We had children whose goals that it was to overcome nightmares or to set better bedtime routines or to set their own bedtime. There were also examples of tamariki who were motivated to support their whanau. One girl on learning that sleep, that, sorry, on learning that screen time can affect your sleep and a lack of sleep can cause bad moods, decided that she would take the TV remote away from her father. Because <laughs> she thought if he wasn't watching TV, he'd get a better night's sleep and he wouldn't be as grumpy. <laughs> I've worked alongside five schools to implement the strategies so far, both in traditional and modern learning environments. Specialists have used the programs to target specific children and families have used the programs in their home. We've had positive t feedback from teachers, parents and children. And one of the main part of the feedback was teachers, parents and children all said that they recognised elements of their sleep routine that were harming them, that they could change. Children also really felt inspired because they noticed that the things they were doing had a direct impact on their life. The next programme is called Yes I Can Sparkle Under Pressure. And this is made to go after the sleep programme which we said because we hoped that the tamariki would be able to hold this knowledge and to use it better if they slept more. Sparkle Under Pressure is a positive coping programme that teaches tamariki how to recognise and manage their stress. The programme is designed to be delivered to small group sizes and there are nine sessions which grow understanding of stress and the impact it has on your mind and body. Children also learn to recognise and support other people who are showing symptoms of stress. Yes I Can compares the formation of a diamond to the children's journey to self-regulation where pressure, heat and carbon atoms can either form coal or diamonds. We thought that children in the face of stress can either use rough strategies or they can sparkle like a diamond under pressure. Tamariki are guided to work through the Pathways goal settings again to tackle their own stress and also to work on reducing the stress of others. We hope that Positive Coping Programme will help children to reduce stress in their immediate environment and give them strategies to reduce the effects of, of long-term stress and prepare them for the stress that they might find in the future. One thing we've heard from the trials is that <coughs> They need more time because once children understand what stress is and what it feels like and what it does to my body, and once they can verbalise it, they just won't stop talking. So that's good. The final programme is Yes I Can Be Kind. And this was developed because teachers asked for support with younger children. The kindness programme is four short sessions and it's guided by the classroom teachers in a kind of circle time environment. It's fully verbal and it provokes kindness and compassion for others. It focuses on positive discussion and re reflection. Tamariki learn about kindness to themselves, like looking after my body or praising myself when I've done a good job. About kindness to other, uh, about kindness to the environment. That's like putting a spider outside if you find it in the classroom. Or kindness to others, telling my teacher that I really like listening to them read. They complete simple forms of pathways goal setting for each area. This program is being trialled this term. <coughs> I've also worked on a project where I collaborated with a really great team which was coordinated by the Neighbourhood Trust where we used Kathleen's research to bring it to our whanau. Uh, this 
is six webinars which are narrated by Di Henwood and they're all quite short, they're about two minutes each and what they do is they really clearly explain the science of stress, what's going on in my body, what that looks like, what I can do about it and really good effective strategies to help your tamariki. Hopefully when you came in as well you would have got a little stress attack card from the front which gives you really clear four step actions that you can take if your child is having a stress attack. And if you watch the webinars, you'll understand what a stress attack might look like. On the back of that card, there's a QR code which you can use to get to the webinars really easy, easily, or you can go on the Neighbourhood Trust or the Bromtree Inquiry websites. The Yes I Can programs are based on an understanding, on understanding and acceptance where tamariki learn about how their body and emotions work, know that their responses are normal, and learn strategies to make positive changes. For our children, this means that they'll learn that they're not alone, that other people feel like them, that their actions are a response to stress, that they're not a bad child, that, and that they have the power to change. I can take charge of my life. Through Yes I Can, I hope that we can arm our tamariki with the knowledge and skills needed to cope positively with stress now and the stress that they will meet in their future. Ho mai he ika ka kai mo te rā, akona ki te ika ka kai mo ake. Kia ora. Tina koto, tina koto, tina koto katoa. Nā mihi nui ki a koto katoa. Ko Mount Hood to Monga, ko Walamat Tiawa, no America aho. Ki o tā tahi taku kainga inaine. Ko Kathleen taku inua. Ki kai ako aho. Ko University of Canterbury, Takukura. No rira, Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Tato Koto. I've lived here in Christchurch since 1990, and I've been a very grateful Kiwi citizen since 1996, even though my accent hasn't changed. <laughs> right now, my grandson lives in Woolston. Here he is, full of hope and excitement, walking into our rebuilding future. Our research is about his future and the future of all the children in our country. But before I get to the results of our research, and our recommendations for families, I need to address a few myths. The first myth is that New Zealand is a stress-free country. We like to believe we're a stress-free, laid-back country, but New Zealand has the world's third highest 12-month prevalence of post-traumatic stress disorder among adults, according to the World Health Organization's 2014 study of 20 high mid and low income countries. Post-traumatic stress is caused by an experience of a traumatic event that changes your body. While this may be a bit different for everyone, generally experiencing a traumatic event before the age of three years or experiencing multiple events during childhood can cause post-traumatic stress. A serious traumatic event can be an adverse event in childhood such as growing up with a parent with a mental health problem the death of a parent or divorce, life-threatening accidents, witnessing domestic violence, and natural disasters. Such events cause traumatic stress, which is associated with changes to our brains and bodies. And traumatic stress can change our DNA expression, as explained by the new science of epigenetics. The Wikipedia article on epigenetics is great. You can start there. Traumatic experiences in our past explain why we have difficulties coping with stress in our daily life. What happened to you in the past affects how your body reacts in the present. For many people, New Zealand is not a stress-free, laid-back country. 
Wishful thinking that it is the same country that it once was is an obstacle that stands in the way of rebuilding. Another harmful myth is the myth that children are naturally resilient and that they'll bounce back from trauma. The fact is, research says children are particularly sensitive and children under three are the most vulnerable group for developing post-traumatic stress and similar stress-related disorders. Our study, uh, which now involves a little more than 4,000 children on the east side of Christchurch. Um, but our, our data before we began with the strategies showed that only about a third of our study children were able to cope consistently with stress by the end of 2015. Now all of our study children are in our main study were under four years of age at the time of the September 2010 earthquake and some weren't yet born. Many more children, here you can see about 34%, but many children had uneven or inconsistent coping. So sometimes as it seems would be going along well, then all of a sudden it would seem for no reason, they'd burst into rage, they'd cry, they'd have a meltdown, or they'd totally withdraw into silence. We also had a third group who had chronic stress. Chronic stress in our studies was defined by having between six and 10 symptoms associated with the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress syndrome. This includes behaviors associated with attention and hyperactivity, anxiety and depression, and conduct oppositional behaviors. Because of the complexity of PTSD, these other disorders are often misdiagnosed instead of PTSD. The myth that children are resilient is very dangerous because it makes people feel left out. If they hear that everyone's resilient and they look at children struggling in their own classrooms or in their own families, they worry that something's wrong. It makes them fearful to reach out for help. It makes them feel excluded. And feeling excluded is a very dangerous part of trying to build a new Christchurch. Another dangerous myth is that parents cause this. I've had very heartfelt emails and notes from parents who feel very guilty about some of their reactions after the earthquake or after some of the events that happened when they had to move for eight times or whatever. I've had letters from parents who had to sleep under the table for three weeks. Parents whose child they thought got afraid of having to go to the port -a so many times in the middle of the night with no electricity. Parents who felt so bad because they cried in, in front of their child. But the fact is that research indicates that children develop PTS symptoms independent of parenting styles. That supportive or punishing parenting made less than 5% of difference in child's PTSD symptoms once they had developed. And finally, that including parents in treatment did not lead to any improvement in the outcomes because parents are not to blame for any of these problems. Instead, research shows that child's traumatic stress problems cause parents anxiety and worry and affect parents' sleep. Parents dragged down by worry struggle to be the best parents they can be. There's another myth, I didn't make a slide for this, I wasn't going to mention it, but there's a myth also that these behaviors are associated with living in poor neighborhoods. We had the same rates right across our high decile schools, our mid decile schools, and our low decile schools. And Maori children were the ones that did the best compared to our pre-earthquake study. So with my colleague, Dr. Sonia McFarlane, we're preparing these results as well. So it is really important that we understand that there are a number of myths that undermine the way we can think about uh, approaching changes that are needed to improve our community. Another myth is that mental health specialists are the only ones who can support children. However, our research has shown that simple strategies can help many children. 
We need to provide support to children in schools and homes to provide a foundation for well-being, and this may even reduce the pressure on our wonderful specialist services. Another myth is that future children will be different. This uh, slide shows uh, from our pre-earthquake study of around 300 children. Uh, these children were born in 2001, and they started school in 2006, and around 8.8% of them had high stress. These are the children who started school in 2013. They're now 10. That's the level of stress they had. It was around 24%. These are the children that started school in 2014. These are the children who started school in 2015. These are the children that started school in 2016. So they were born in 2011. And finally, we have children born in 2012. That was uh, last year of that, where we had thousands of earthquakes, I believe. These are now six. So there's a consistent pattern of much higher chronic stress, very high stress in a high proportion of these children. What about the children born since then? Well, in our replication study, we've been able to collect data from preschools, kindergartens, and schools before these schools introduced strategies. So these are the children who were born in 2013. They're just under 20% high stress, even though they're just turning five years old. These are the four-year-olds. These are the three-year-olds born in 2015. These are the two-year-olds born in 2016. How can we explain this? The earthquakes are in our bodies and we are changed by this. In addition, experts acknowledge that the post-disaster stressors facing communities, the changes in individual families, moving homes, changing jobs, changing schools, experiencing additional disasters such as floods and fires can have a cumulative effect and increase stress symptoms. The science of epigenetics suggests that the DNA of parents and everyone in the community has been changed. The earthquakes and all the experiences since are in our bodies, and it is this that has created the new normal. As John and Bree have explained, we have new strategies that address the biological basis of children's stress-related problems. These strategies have made a positive difference because they address directly the bio biological basis of the changes to the children's bodies. The results of this study from our five main schools following the same children show that over three years, three years, this is not a magic bullet, strategies show changes in the pattern of children's coping. Children who are coping well show few, if any, symptoms of stress as they meet the challenges in daily life. The percent of children coping well has doubled over the past three years. Back to our lead schools, during the same time, the percent of children with chronic stress, those who often show six to 10 stress symptoms during the school day, was cut by half. We know these improvements are not just maturation because these changes are not happening in the children of the same ages in our replication study. Strategies can also improve children's learning over time. First, calm down the environment, Second, improve health. Third, teach sleep and coping. Then, learning can improve. This slide shows important improvements in the percent of children who are achieving the expected standards for their age in reading, writing, and math. The red bar shows the percent that were meeting these before the strategies in 2015, and after three years of strategies, these are the same children in these data. These show that children can catch up to the level of achievement expected for them. Our replication study of 1,200 randomly selected children from schools and kindergartens is showing similar results for coping and for learning, and we expect to have those results later this year. Stressed out, anxious, aggressive, and irritable children need our support. The first step is to understand more about stress and, as John said, stop the blame and shame game. 
Number two, calm down ourselves, our homes, and our schools. And three, be aware of the physical toll of stress, dehydration, low energy, poor sleep, and take steps to address these. We can't support children if we're blaming parents or we're blaming teachers. These behaviors of children are not choices. They're not choosing to behave that way. Who would choose to feel that awful feeling inside when you're so out of control? We all need to take the time to understand how stress affects our bodies, our heart rate, our ability to sleep, our reactions to noise, our irritations at minor things in life, like someone being a bit slow to get their F postcard out of their wallet. The more we understand, the better we will be able to cope. Choose optimistic teaching and optimistic parenting based on positive psychology. Give your child hope. Play, eat, learn for families based on research into well-being for families and the effects of stress on families. Ask, can you change your evening schedule? Can you eat your evening meal together? Turn off the TV and all those devices. Watching TV gives your children the message that the TV or the device is more important than they are. After eating, try a family power hour or even a half hour. Clean up after the meal together. Play a game. Take a walk around the block. Look at family photos and talk about family history. Work on a big puzzle you can borrow from the library. With these strategies, you give your child closeness. Take steps to address how stress impacts children's, water, uh, children's bodies. Drink, I think I must need a drink of water. Drink to think and think to drink at home. So taking a drink of water when you're stressed, when you're confused, when you're tired, makes you feel better. Um, I love the story about one of the principals who had a, didn't really believe me about the water and they thought your body would tell you when you're really dehydrated, but that's only if you're near death. And so when, when the children were sent to her, I have to say, thank you, sweetie, mostly, mostly boys, she'd have a big glass of water and she'd ask them to drink it down before she talked to them. And some of them asked for more water. And after they drank the water, they were so much calmer, she could actually talk to them. So we teach children in an educational program when to take a drink of water, how much water to drink. And we also found that uh, after the Drink to Think program was implemented, we heard reports from parents and teachers that many children stopped wetting the bed. So they had wet the bed because they had been so dehydrated that their bladders hadn't grown properly. So once they drank a lot of water, the bedwetting went away. More than 70 studies have shown that a dietary supplement, omega-3, can help children be calmer. Our study parents use Nutrilife Smart Bites Omega-3 capsules, which are available for 38 cents a day. Send a high carbohydrate snack, as John mentioned, such as a slice of wholemeal bread with butter, butter also has omega-3, to school for morning tea, and take one to work for yourself. And can you calm down your child's sleep environment? They don't need all those decorations or stressful colors like red and black or fairy lights. Help your child learn about sleep and choose calm. Choose to give your child health. And finally, community support. This is not just a vague platitude. It's an expression of support all during the day. For example, greet everyone positively. Say hi to the slouching boy with a hoodie and smile at the girl with the blue hair and the piercings. Say hey to the cheeky lad with the jandals and Kiora to the man in the walker. Reach out to struggling parents with a kind smile and distract their sobbing child by pulling a funny face. We need to lose the judgment eyes to achieve this. Community support is a feeling of inclusion and helping. Difficult to put into words, but it's the number one public health factor associated with overall well-being. With this strategy, give every fauna hope.
The importance of shared support cannot be underestimated. Parents, Fano, teachers, aunties, grandfathers, neighbors, we must all work together. Here's Theo. He's looking, he's waiting to see if we're with him. There he goes into the future. Are we holding him back or are we going with him? We are all changing and we must all work together for the best future for our country and our community. I'm going to make it easy for Kathleen by um, letting her sit down because I'm sure you'll have lots of questions. So I'd just like to open the floor. Um, we have a microphone too, and so this young lady will be looking around with it. Are you anticipating um, doing future studies on children who were? Um, older, uh, when the earthquakes happened, are you anticipating doing a study to um, look at children who were probably between 10 and 13, who are now young adults going into adulthood? Uh, because I feel there's a gap there, and it's a major gap. Um, I do believe you are correct with all your young children, and I find this fascinating talk, but I also feel that there are a group of children out there who are young teens and late teens who have been badly affected as well. I'm not sure you heard that, but we have a question about uh, studies with other groups of children. Um, this is the only longitudinal study of children in a post-earthquake environment. We, we haven't found anything published. We have a study going on now that's a baseline study of the mental health of teenagers with one of my master's students, Kirsty. Uh, she's just working on the results now, and that, those results will be shared with the uh, principals. Um, but we're not sure whether this will lead to further research or not. So those of you, I know I have a number of students here and I know there's some other students I probably don't know yet, but I'd like to encourage you to target this area in research. We really need help, and I think we can learn a lot. Uh, the community has uh, been wonderfully supportive. I didn't get a chance to acknowledge all the help we've had in doing this study. But the research does indicate that by looking at the age of the child at the start of the September quake sequence, and looking at the neurological developmental milestones associated with the age they were at the earthquake, you can actually work out some of the patterns of differences that are showing up in our different age groups. This is another question up at the back. I'm just wondering whether it might all, because we've only got one, you might all want to just come around the microphone. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? So just a little reminder to the people on Facebook. Um, there's, um, we have 46 people online and there's a 20 second delay. So please send your questions and we will get to them. Let's go to the next question. Hello, I have um, two questions. Uh, my son was involved in the study and I was wondering if um, at age 10 now, if he's going to be continued to be studied um, as he goes through his primary school years and into high school. Um, because I have really liked what you have fed back to our school. Um, we are lucky enough to have had the same things that John Bangmars talked about. Um, and I can, we can certainly see positive effect from those. The other thing is Bree mentioned um, empathy and developing empathy. Uh, do one of those yes I can um, courses I think. Um, 
help with developing empathy. Um, actually, our study uh, concluded, our final data collection concluded in December. And thank you very much for your continued support and participation. More information will be being sent out to the parents in the study and to the schools over the next term or so. Um, we had hoped that there would be a, able to be continued uh, study into uh, the high school years and the intermediate years. Uh, we're working on liaising with our, another research group to see if that can be accomplished. Along the lines of developing empathy, the programs, especially the positive coping program and the kindness program, a lot of their focus is on realising how things impact you and also understanding how they impact other people, how we can see stress in other people, how it's displayed and how we can acknowledge and respect it and support other people. So using positive psychology education, what they do is they get tamariki to really identify things within themselves and ask them to identify things within other people and that helps to grow. So I think there was a, was there another question up the back? Yes, we'll take we'll take another question from the room and then we'll go to the Facebook question. That's um, hi, just an advice question, not around research or anything. Um, I'm sure many people in this room have multiple children who were different ages um, in our family. I went through the earthquakes when I was going into the, the phase that she was talking about before I was 12, then we, you know, 10, younger, um, and now we have a, a four-year-old. Is there anything that us older kids can do, because we went through it at a different time and she wasn't even born, to help that generation who are going through that stress still? Because as Kathleen was talking about, it, it, it's in their blood. So so what's happening with that? Can we do anything for them as, our, as their older siblings? Um, we have a replication study and the strategies are, are being adapted by preschools and kindergartens. Uh, we are collecting data on that now and should have results later on, but it looks like the same kind of strategies adapted by the fantastic preschool and early childhood teachers have calmed those classrooms, the preschools, right down. So I think it's a general way of making, changing and calming the environment changing the schedule a bit, increasing the amount of water that's available to children to drink, and changing some of the interactions that preschool teachers and children usually have to uh, patterns more suited to the children's current biological imperatives. Thank you. We have a question here. Can we be confident that the changes in stress and classroom behaviour are largely associated to the earthquake factors as opposed to other social factors or changes in the educational environment? Um, well, as confident as anyone can be, um, all of our schools, uh, that's why we're running the replication study as well. So all, all of the schools have tried different things. The only things they have in common are the strategies, and we see the strategies coming through in the same trends in the same schools in every school decile. We also are pretty sure it's not confounded by maturation or other changes. We certainly saw an effect of the bushfire in the Port Hills. Uh, Four of our five uh, lead schools were flooded in 2014 and 2016. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we could see that because the families, a lot of family homes were flooded as well. Uh, we have data from parents, uh, but as you know, any study can, can be uh, fraught with limitations. Um, I, I feel quite good that our first uh, study was published in a prestigious journal, and I'm hoping that the results of the strategies will meet the peer review process as well. 
But I, I also want to add that the, something I don't think John said, but most of the schools are in our replication study heard about the uh, strategies uh, from either John or myself or Moraine and decided to adopt them. And they started in 2017, 2017 and 2018. And they, their trajectory of increasing post-traumatic stress symptoms was a straight line from what we've had before. And we have a break in the strategy schools and we're seeing similar results in our replication study. Um, so I think we have pretty strong evidence and as I said there's no other evidence like this out there so it may not be great but it's something versus nothing which most communities are struggling with. <laughs> I think the context of this study is the earthquakes but we all know that the children are affected with PTSD through domestic violence, sexual abuse, physical abuse, death of a parent, um, all sorts of things. And the PTSD is the issue that we're trying to address. And so these strategies are going to support every child in every situation wherever they are, not just the ones affected by earthquakes, but beyond that as well. And I, there is no guarantee you're dealing with people. So this is something that we've seen is actually making a difference. And if we don't do anything, we'll just complain about the outcome. At least we're trying to make a difference for the kids we've got. I think we've run out of time now, and I'm mindful of that, but um, if, if people want to come and talk to the speakers, um, you're most welcome to, and Kathleen also has her email address here on the screen, so please feel free to contact her. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.